Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Mary, Greg, and I are delighted to be with you this morning. We wish you all a blessed Sabbath. We're pleased that you have decided to join us in person in this Sabbath school class and visually at home to study God's Word through the Sabbath school lesson. Mary, will you invoke God's presence? Yes, let's bow our heads. Our gracious Heavenly Father, happy Sabbath. We're so very grateful that you've set aside a day for us to come together to worship you, to spend time with you, to dig into your word, your love letter for us. Amen. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to please come into each and every one of our hearts and our minds to guide our understanding as we learn about living wisely as you inspired the Apostle Paul to write to the Ephesians. Yes. Thank you because you have said where two or three are gathered, that here you are. And so we pray for your presence here and with those who are at home. And we're also praying for the audiovisual that all Amen. will run smoothly, Lord, to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much, Mary. Uh, this week's Sabbath School lesson is entitled Living Wisely. Of course, we are studying Ephesians. And today we are going to study Ephesians chapter 5 verses 1 to 20. The uh, key text, the memory text, is found in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 17. And by the way, Mary on Wednesday will unpack quite a lot of those verses. But here's what the memory text tells us. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Verse 16. Making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand that the will of the Lord, or understand what the will of the Lord is. And I'm not going to spend time on this, because I know that our Wednesday's lesson really uh, refers to those particular verses. But it is wonderful that through, through the Apostle Paul, God is telling us that we need to take advantage of every moment of time mm. for great and noble purposes. By the way, that's what, what, what it means to making the best use of your time. And that there can be no wise living without understanding. But the understanding that you and I require is the knowledge of the Holy One, as Proverbs tells us in Chapter 9, verses 10. So that's important. We will hear more about those particular verses. And I just wanted to introduce uh, the... Um, I just wanted to introduce the, uh, the mem memory text that way. As a brief overview, and I hope uh, that that matters. Uh, it matters to us, and it uh, should matter to you. As a brief overview of this week's Sabbath School lesson... I would like to uh, make the following statements. This morning we are going to spend most of our allocated Sabbath school time to review and to study Ephesians 5, verses 1 to 20. In this special passage of Scripture, a significant passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul contrasts what pagans and believers value and I think it is important for us to understand, to understand that. Paul tells us that pagans value a racy story. Ephesians 5.4. I'm not reading. I'm quoting. The Apostle Paul tells us that pagans value a drunken party. Ephesians 5.18. That pagans value a debauch sex. Ephesians 5. 3 and 5. And these are the great treasures of life for pagans. In contrast, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 5 to 7, that true believers, knowing that an ultimate day of appraisal is coming, 
when the true value of all things will become apparent, that they treasure all that is good and right and true in Christ, as we read in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 9. Therefore, the Apostle, the, the, the Apostle Paul, um, referring to you and I as believers, they ask us, or the Apostle Paul asks us to snap up the bargains found in Christ as we live in the threshold of eternity. Ephesians 5, 15 to 17. You see, worldview and identity determines values and wisdom. That's just the bottom line. A Gentile world will develop a certain set of values and a certain type of wisdom. On the other hand, God's kingdom, God's worldview, God's values generate an entirely different type of wisdom. Paul is appealing to that. For this reason, Paul does not call Christians to embrace the wisdom of one of the moderate philosophical schools or even emulate the Greek or Roman pride in striving for virtue. Rather, Paul views Christian wisdom as rooted in God's sacrificial love for you and for me, in Christ's light for you and for me, and in pure morality. The wise Christian will run away from the wisdom of the world, which is expressed in all-consuming sexual debauchery egocentric boasting and getting drunk. Instead, the wise Christian will wake up from the sleep of the world, will be enlightened by Christ's gospel, will be empowered by the presence of the Holy Spirit, will grab the moment of salvation, and will worship God. Please note, the difference between the wisdom of this world and the wisdom of God consists in understanding. I'm going to ask you to pay attention. Understanding on who is the object of one's worship. Is it self or is it God? Understanding on who are we centered on. Is it God or is it self? Understanding who we are filled with. Are we filled with God or with self? This week's Sabbath School study emphasizes three main themes. And that's what the three of us are going to unpack with you. Christian wisdom is rooted in God's revelation or Christ's light. A. B. Christian wisdom is not a collection of witty statements about life. Rather, it is a lifestyle, a walk of life transformed by the Holy Spirit according to the pattern left to us in Christ. And thirdly, Christian wisdom is about salvation and worship. Worship of God and worship with our God. Amen. Mary. Sunday is an in interesting lesson, so I want to introduce it this way. In Sunday's lesson, the Apostle Paul urges believers to walk in love and by imitators and be imitators of God. Unpack this lesson. All righty. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. So today's lesson focuses on Ephesians five one to five, in which Paul contrasts two differing lifestyles. One, as Victor mentioned, is a follower or imitator of God, walking in love and giving thanks. The other is the opposing lifestyle of those who do not follow or imitate God, which leads to sexual impurity and ultimately loss of the kingdom of Christ. So that's an overall view of these five verses. So let's review. Um, Verses 1 to 2. Can I ask someone to please read that? Sure. There, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children 
and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Thank you. So please note, and, and this is the four point. I've got four points regarding um, these verses. This is the first point. So please note that this exhortation comes after the closing verses of chapter 4, um, right. in which last week we studied, we're called to put off the old man, right? To be renewed in the spirit of your mind and to put on the new man. Those we all covered last week. So Paul is coming from, after saying that, he says, therefore, be imitators. It's only through this taking off the old man, putting on the new one, this rebirth experience, that we can live as he's going to, scri to describe in chapter 5. So here Paul is urging the Ephesian Christians to follow and imitate God. And we can be imitators of God because we put on the new man, which in chapter 4, verse 24, is created after the likeness of God. And in Ephesians 1, verse, verse 5, Paul pointed out that God has predestined us into the adoption of his children by Jesus Christ. So children imitate their parents, correct? So therefore, as we spend time with our Heavenly Father, we will imitate him. Yes. And in Ephesians 2.10, we also need to remember that he said we are his work, workmen, ship, ship. Yep. that's right, mm -hmm. created in Christ Jesus. There again is that creation in Jesus. So therefore, following and imitating God should be a natural outcome. Amen. The second point that I wanted to point out is according to verse 2, how are we to imitate or follow God? There's an action word there, walking in love as Christ. Right. The Greek word for walk means to regulate one's life, to conduct oneself in the virtue of love. So how do we conduct our lives? I'm sorry, how we conduct our lives and how we live is vitally important. Mm -hmm. He repeats this word of walking two other times in this chapter, and we're going to read that. But one is walk as children of light. That's in verse 8. And in verse 15, it's walk circumspectly. So this walking, how we choose to live, how we regulate our lives is very important. And we'll get into these verses later in the lesson. He also mentions walk three other times in this letter. So the theme of how we live our lives and how we conduct ourselves is paramount in Paul's teaching. Mm -hmm. And he is just being used by the Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit who's teaching us how important it is for us to walk, conduct ourselves in our life. And yes. that word walk, it's in the imperative. So he's not saying walk in love. He's saying walk in love. It's a command. Yes, thank you very much for pointing that out. And he's empowering us to do that, right? Because of he's the, we are his workmanship. We're created in his image. So he's not asking us to do something that we can't do. He's saying, I will provide you all the means to do that. And uh, one interesting thing, walking is like the only mode of, tra like the universal mode of transportation. So walking love is a universal mode of us imitating Christ through love. I mean, it's, it's, it works through any religion, any culture. Everybody recognizes genuine love. Thank and they can come to that. Out, David. That's, a, that's a wonderful point. And the third point that I want to bring up is walking in love isn't to be modeled after my definition or understanding of love. It's to be modeled after what standard? Whose standard? Right. Christ's right. love for us. Right. Because he says, and walk in love as Christ. 
So Christ's love for us, especially as displayed by his self-sacrifice, as Victor had mentioned earlier. And again it says, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Now Paul, in his letter to the Romans, in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the Holy Spirit gives him a little clearer insight. He said, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this verse, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your rational service. So see, there's a connection there between those verses. To walk in love as Christ, what do you guys think that, that means? How, how do you imagine that? I'll, I'll share with you what I think it is, but I just wanted to ask, does anyone want to share what your thoughts are when you read that, walk in love as Christ? A lot of work on this will need to be done, and for Paul to do that for Ephesians, you know, to the Church of Ephesians, and to us today. I mean, walk in love with Jesus. Think of Jesus' life when, you know, from childhood up to the, you know, crucifixions. You know, he never think of himself. Right. It's a selfless kind uh, of love. For me, to walk in love in God. He had to be in my heart. He had to be inside my life, my mind, my spirit. There is no way I can walk in God if He is not in me. It's impossible because without Him, what I have inside? A lot of bad things. Yeah. I never want to walk like that. Now, when He is in me, I can give a testimony about Jesus Christ's character. And I'm, I'm walking with Him. And people are going to see that, and they're going to know what is to walk. Even I can give my testimony, what is to walk in God? Mm -hmm. But it has to be a transformation in my life, and there has to be fruit from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for sharing that, Walter. Um, for me... There was an end up. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I think Jesus went one step further when he said to people after, like us today, how, when he said, how can you love me who you don't see when you, don't, when you, when you, you can't see when you don't love those who you do see? Mm -hmm. So, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is a love chapter. And it's out, so. Thank you. A lot of people say they love God, but they don't love their neighbors, they don't love their friends, they get angry with everybody, or road rage, or whatever. You know, right. That's how it goes, I guess. Barbara, did you well, I, I was thinking about the time Christ lived in, and it was not an easy time. They were captives by the Romans. So they were always being watched. They, um, he, he was hated in his, own, in his own home, country. They tried to throw him off a cliff. And he still was able to walk in love, mm -hmm. and not in anger, not in fear, not in hurt, but he was a able to walk in love. Mm -hmm. Even Judas, who was going to betray him, remained one of his disciples throughout the whole time, and Christ knew that. Christ could have gotten bitter about Judas. He could have started, you know, picking at Judas. He did not do those kinds of things. Thank you very much for everyone for sharing. Okay. Just to add to what Barbara says, I read that in Ellen White's uh, book. I, I forgot what was that. But, you know, Jesus eating with the one who betrayed him. Jesus uh, uh, lived or sleep in the house that who hate him. So, you know, if we have enemy, you know, or somebody hates us, can we be with them, eating in the same table? Can you love yeah. them? Can you love them? Exactly. You know, you know Mary, very briefly, you read Romans. Romans for me encompasses what life is all about. When we talk in Ephesians 5, we've, we've got to walk. That means I've got to be alive to walk. I cannot walk if I'm dead. And then it says, if you walk in love, if you walk in the light, if you walk in wisdom, as we will talk a little later, I've got to really, like Jesus Christ, be a sacrifice for him on earth. 
So my life on earth is only worth it when I sacrifice self for the sake of Christ. Amen. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. That's, that. That winds it up. I'm sorry, we've got to move forward or we're going to run out of time. <laughs> but I wanted to move on to the second half of today's passage. And it's Ephesians 5, 3 to 5. Can I ask someone to read that, please? Five, for you maybe, you said from three to five? Yeah, from three oh. to five. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Thank you very much. So Paul here is expressing concern for lifestyle and sexual ethics. The Christian converts are in danger of reverting back to their previous sexual behavior that would have a devastating impact on their Christian walk and testimony. So as we've learned from previous lessons, the Ephesian culture was steeped in the worship of Diana and of other gods. The Greco-Roman world exhibited moral corruption as described elsewhere, not only here, but elsewhere in the New Testament. And banquets and celebrations featured the behaviors that Paul describes here, right? Sexual immorality, foolish talk, crude jokes, covetousness, which is greediness and idolatry. So is our society really any different from the Greco-Romans? <laughs> no. no, we're not. As, uh, are we as believers in 2023 at risk of adopting these practices into our lifestyle. Oh, yes. Sexual violence and abuse, often fueled by pornography, are realities that are even currently experienced within Christian believers. So therefore, we must be watchful and sober and heed God's advice. Amen. So verse 4 states, instead, let there be what? Thanksgiving. Let there be thanksgiving. So as an alternative of recounting sexual experiences and conquests and jokes and just crude um, language, we should engage in thankful speech, Amen. always Amen. directed to God for all of his blessings, his love, his mercy, his grace. And lastly, point number four. Living a life that revolves around sexual sin is more than a threat to the effectiveness and unity of the church in the present. That's what Paul's saying. It also imperils the future salvation of the individuals involved. Because as stated at the end of verse 5, none who are in, engaged in such activity have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Amen. So it's not only going to impact our present lives in a very negative way. Eternal life is lost if we engage in this. Amen. So how do we apply these points practically in our lives? How do we imitate God, walk in love as Christ, put away all forms of uncleanliness, foolish talk, greed, and idolatry, and focus on giving thanks to God. Well, I found this one quote from Sister White, and I think we have it. It's, um, yeah, Signs of the Times. It says, God will honor and uphold every true-hearted, earnest soul who is seeking to walk before him in the perfection of Christ's grace. He will never leave nor forsake one humble, trembling follower of his. He will work in the hearts of those who receive him, making his children pure and holy by his rich grace, qualifying them to be laborers together with him. See, it's about his grace and we accepting it. Amen. Amen. With keen, sanctified perception, they will appreciate the strength of his promises and appropriate them, not because of any worthiness of their own, but because by living faith, 
they avail themselves of the benefits of Christ's sacrifice and receive the robe of his righteousness. So I wanted to end with that. I found that very inspiring as to how we can be imitators and always be giving thanks to our God. Amen. Thanks, Mary. Thanks so much. Great. Yes. Paul exhorts us to walk as children of life. Yes, we will. Good morning and happy Sabbath to each of you. I haven't had a chance to say happy Sabbath. And to our dear friends, um, Scusi and uh, Chow, and uh, welcome back from Italy. <laughs> I know you guys were looking around. <laughs> Scusi <laughs> and ciao, ciao. So we just want to welcome you guys back. Th praise God for a safe yeah. travel for you guys. Um, so today's Sabbath school, Monday's lesson is titled Walking as Ch Children of Light. And we're going to get to this specifically in just a minute here. But let's just first go back and get a little contrasting perspective. And we're going to pick up in verse 5 that Mary had just touched on. But let's begin by reading Ephesians chapter 5, verses 5 through 7. So if someone could please read that for us. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. Thank you, Daniel. So Paul is pretty straightforward here in his words, but let's just unpack this a little bit, especially for those who may be a little newer to the faith and, and newer to understanding what some of these terms mean. So in verse 5, depending upon the version that you're, that you're reading, the Bible version, the term could be whoremonger or fornicator, but it's the same word in the Greek, which is pornos, and that's where we get the term pornography, and Mary had mentioned that. Right. And it means, of course, a man who indulges in unlawful sexual activity. And Paul can certainly mean this literally, because it does have a little a literal application, but he's also equating it to spiritual adultery with God. Right. having another God before him. That Absolutely is spiritual adultery right. against God. An unclean person, and you could think of this, okay, well, is God talking literally or is he talking spiritually, metaphorically, or both? An unclean person, does that mean someone who doesn't bathe regularly? I don't think so. So let's, let's look at this. According to the Greek lexicon, the word unclean that Paul is talking about is the word Archithartos, and archithartos means unclean in a moral sense, unclean in thought and life. And a covetous man who is an idolater. So a covetous man in the Greek is pleonictus, and pleonictus means greedy of gain. So if this person is greedy of gain and an idolater, and an idolater in the Greek in this context is idolatress, meaning a covetous man as a worshiper of man, mammon. So he's greedy of gain and a worshiper of mammon, not a worshiper of God. Okay, so that's why I wanted to go through this a little bit because it gives a little bit more in-depth understanding as to what God is talking about. And so we know that none of these persons will have any inheritance in the kingdom of heaven. So... Paul is talking really about not only their thoughts, but their actions as well. So it really is literal, but also in a spiritual sense. He's talking about their character and how is their character measured? How is all of our character measured? It's measured against the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are, are we loving God with all our heart, with all our soul, and all our strength? And are we loving our neighbor as ourselves? What is the content of our moral um, our moral character, our thoughts, our words, our thoughts of life, etc. So, and keep in mind too that if we look even at 1 John verse 3.15, and this is just to show that God has a dual application in what he's telling us often. Sometimes it's very specific, but sometimes it's also a dual application. 1 John 3.15 says, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And I've had many conversations with 
fellow Christians said, I've never murdered anyone. Well, have you ever been angry <laughs> at a brother without mm-hmm. reason or, mm-hmm. or not? And if so, we're told that that's the same as murder. So that's, it, it's just very important for us to understand. Then as we move to verse 6, it tells us, let no one deceive you with vain or empty words. And this I thought was really important because vain and empty words in the Greek, the Greek word for that is kinos, meaning empty, vain, and most importantly, devoid of truth. Yes, oh, Michelle. We can also murder with our words. Absolutely. Um, killing someone's character, saying untrue things about them, that's murdering. Absolutely. Anything... From the motive of the heart that means harm to someone else, I think can all be included in that. David? Yeah, I wanted to, uh, really nicely, you brought up this duality. Flesh affects spirit, spirit affects flesh. So this is so interesting because whatever we do will affect our spirit, and then the spirit will affect our flesh. And uh, John 4, 24 says, God is spirit, those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So yes. when we're connected with God through the Holy Spirit, actually that's the only way to control this flesh and stay connected to Jesus. And, uh, you know, I was going to say, there's um, the DNA in our DNA can make zillions of people. So far we have 100 billion people on the planet. So the, the fact that we are here today is a miracle because so many people will never be born. And based on knowing that, you know, we really need to focus on God Amen. more than anything else. Amen. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Thank you for your comments there. And, and again, let's keep in mind what God is talking about is let no one deceive us in vain or empty words. Let's look at Isaiah 8, 20. If someone could please read that for us. Isaiah 8, Ooh, verse 20. Powerful words. <laughs> Sorry, I, I usually fix those, but I just want to. Uh, well, I was going to say, <laughs> my Bible doesn't have that word. I don't know why, but I had to, I had to go through and fix it. Okay. That's to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Amen. So that is what, what Paul's talking about here, the word kinos, devoid of truth. If they don't speak according to the law and to the testimony, to the law and to the prophets, there's no light in them. Mm-hmm. And if, if we listen to anybody, anybody with these empty words, it's going to lead us into disobedience. Absolutely. And disobedience is sin. Mm-hmm. Okay. The empty word. How can you be deceived by the empty word? It, well, just as Isaiah says, if they speak not according to the law or to the testimony, in other words, if it goes against the word of God, like it's okay. You can have drink. You can have intoxicating drink. Just don't drink too much. Okay. Okay. We're going to get into that a little bit later, but that's not what God says in His word, and so. You can, you can say, it's okay to go to the red light district in Amsterdam. Don't worry about it. You're experiencing travel. Really. So those are empty words. That goes against what God says in his word. Byron. Even an extended ex- or definition for the word pertaining to a complete lack of understanding and insight. In other words, I'm taking it and I'm twisting it to suit my own purpose. But it has nothing to do with God. Well, Amen. If you, if you remember, that's, that's so spot on because it's going according to your dictates and not the dictates of God and His right. heart for that's us. That's correct. If you remember last week when we were unpacking that, any word that is not uplifting, any word that is not spoken out of love to uplift and to grow you in Christ, that's the definition. Amen. It's empty. No. Empty. Amen. Yes. But this is more I, specific, I think. It's in the spiritual, like uh, what Bible says, yeah. like, you know, to, suit, to, to fit your purpose. It's okay to drink, you know. You just have to forgive. You just have to pray and ask for forgiveness. Again. And, but I think, I think we also have to look at God's word. And if we know something is wrong and we do it anyway, that's sin. 
So to knowingly do and say, but it's okay, God will forgive me, then that's getting into the once saved, always saved mentality. We, we, that's not what God wants to lead us. He wants to change and restore our hearts to clean us from our unrighteousness. Um, let me just move on real quick. There was another question, Michelle. Yeah, my comment was on what, adding to what Victor said. He was saying that you know we don't speak to someone with love to encourage, to grow, to build them up, that we are not speaking the word of God. And I think that uh, we, many times we may be well-meaning, but we may say things that are hurtful yeah. to someone else. And I have a, a story that's a brief story I'm going to say very shortly. A friend that was a school teacher that knew that at the end of the school year she wouldn't have a job. And she was a widow, a single, how she could survive. So every day she encouraged herself with the word of God to be able to go to work and function and be sunny and work with kids in third grade. So parents that were well-meaning, knew knowing her situation, would instead of come and speak from God, they didn't pray for the Holy Spirit to guide their words. They meant well, but they would come to her and say, how are you going to survive? What are you going to do? Which, in fact, would tear her down from, she had, you know, been come in encouraged by the Word of God that God will provide, will protect, will take care of her. And then someone well-meaning would come and speak something that's really not from God, but it sounds like it's caring. And it was caring, but... They're not guided by the Holy Spirit. So I think we don't realize how much we can do, even if we're well-meaning. I think it's so important that we're connected to the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much. That's such a great example because we can think that we're doing something that's kind, but what comes out of our mouth may not sound like that. And so we, we must be connected to God through the power of the Holy Spirit and let Him do the speaking for us knew what to say. He was connected to God the Father, Amen. and while he was human, God spoke to him and gave him the words that he needed to speak Precise. to people. And we know that, um, that God's, it says God's wrath will come upon the sons of disobedience, and God warns of judgment. And it's not a judgment like, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you. He's warning people, look, come to me, come to me, stay connected to me. Because if you're not, my protective powers, my love no longer covers you because you rejected me. And that's when the wrath, the consequences of breaking God's law comes upon ourselves. And so I want to go right now to... Um, to verse number seven, and therefore God pleads with us not to be partners with those who choose disobedience. So he's pleading with us. This plead comes out of God's love for us. He knows what the end result will be if we reject him, and he doesn't want that for us. So he's pleading with us not to receive the wrath of the choices that we make that distance ourselves from God. Let's read Ephesians 5, 8 through 10, and this, we, we're not going to need to spend a lot of time on this because it says it very specifically and we'll, um, we'll give a verse that we all know and understand. But let's read this right now because this is really the, the crux of the lesson, walking as children of light. So if someone could read Ephesians 8 through 10, please. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Amen. Thank you very much. So this Paul is telling us very plainly and clearly that before accepting Jesus, before accepting God into our lives, we're in darkness. But now that we have chosen to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are now in light of the Lord. So therefore, walk as children of light, having the fruit of the Spirit. So what are the fruits of the Spirit? We'll look here at Galatians 5, through 23. I know most of you have these memorized. I always have to look back and refer to it. But this is how we know that we're walking in the light of God. It's having the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That covers everything we've talked about so far that goes against the flesh, but is in line with who God is. And he gives us, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the, uh, the gifts of the Spirit. Against such there is no law. So 
the proof or the evidence of us walking in the light of God is revealed in our walk with Jesus. But that walk is also reflected to others, not only here in the church, but to our neighbors, to our family, to our friends, to strangers. Are we walking in that light? And that's the one practical aspect that we have to take away from this is, I think we all need to be asking the Lord daily, are we walking in your light? Am I possessing the gifts of the Spirit? And if not, why not? What's standing in my way? Help me to be willing to let you take that out of my way so that I will be walking in your light and reflecting the gifts of the Spirit. So that takes care of my business. Thank you, Greg. Sure. So would you walk in a light? Are you willing to walk in the light, in love, in the light? That's an important question. Tuesday's lesson, I love the title. The title is, uh, is uh, if, you, if, you, if you're not walking with the Lord, it's abusive. But if you're walking with the Lord, the title is rejuvenating. See, the title of your Tuesday lesson is, Awake, Victor, O Sleeper. Now, I just use my name because I don't want to use anybody else's name. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's a, a reality. So let's read those verses, the verses that are applicable to Tuesday's lesson. And really, uh, as you can see, we are unpacking the first 20 verses of chapter 5. We dealt with verses 1 to 6, 7 to 10. We are now going to go 11 to 14. And uh, in Ephesians 5, 11 to 14, the Apostle Paul provides to us believers, and we claim to be believers. Anybody here that doesn't claim to be a believer? Okay, so we all believers. So if I say we're all believers, it's you and I all together here. Okay, so Paul tells us believers but, um, uh, provides a powerful warning. And so let's uh, end. So there's, there's two things that come from these two verses. A warning and then instruction. So let's unpack that. Let's read it first, first and <clears throat> foremost. Ephesians 5, 11 to 14. Is there a volunteer? And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you the light. Thank you, Sherry. So the very first three verses is a warning. The last verse, verse 14, is an instruction. So let's unpack that. And we've got to see this in light of everything that Mary and Greg has already discussed it. So we're going to do that. So. To fully understand the passage of scripture that we've just read, it is helpful to observe that in chapter 5, which is the chapter we are reading and studying, uh, Paul repeatedly offers two exhortations to live by. The first of these exhortations, and what, with the, these were read both by Mary and by Greg, is found in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8. So, um, Barbara, if you, if you bring, bring per per perfect. So, Paul urges us to live a God-honoring lifestyle as children of light. So, the very first exhortation says, You were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Therefore, walk as children of light. That's that simple. The second exhortation is obviously 511. And Paul tells us not to live a sexually moral, God-opposing lifestyle, exhibiting the unfruitful works of darkness. So what does 511 say? Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Oh, we are going to unpack that last sentence about exposing darkness. Because uh, that's part of 
Paul's instruction to you and me. It's also part of his warning when it comes into that. Okay. So what is Paul telling us in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 11? Well, let's go back to uh, Ephesians 5.8. Barbara, can you go back to Ephesians 5.8? Yeah, yes, See, Paul tells us that believers are to live among unbelievers as what? <coughs> light in, <coughs> light in, the or in the Lord and children of light. of light. Now, do you now understand why the God is telling the disciples, I'm going to go, but you are going to stay? Do you now understand? Mm -hmm. Because if the, they did not stay, they could not be bearers of light. And if you're not a bearer of light, darkness reigns. And when darkness reigns, sin is not visible. I, I really hope you're getting it. So when God says to you and to me, you need to be a child of light. It is not for your own sake only. But it is to ensure that any sin around you is visible. That's very important. Walk at the darkness, at the park, at the night, we have flashlight. Right. You can see clear. Exactly. But how soon you turn off, you in your mind is like, a, oh, there is a thing here, but you can see it. That's it's exactly all this in your mind, and you think you are in control. Exactly. You, you think you are in a, going a, in, a, in a correct way, but that's not for sure. Exactly. Thank you. Now let's go to Ephesians 5.9. I think we, we also read that before. But Paul explains that the whole reason we are to be children of light and light in the world is to be exposed and be seen. Ha, 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 this is not tough. Now, it's okay. It's okay if I look at others. But don't you dare to look at me. But the Apostle Paul is now saying, Oh, no, Victor. Oh, no. If you claim to be a child of light, you are going to be exposed. People are going to look at you. And you need to be seen. So what does that verse say? For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And by the way, all the other elements of the fruit of the Spirit that you read. So, I, if I am not good, righteous, and truthful, am I walking in the light? Obviously not. Okay? This is important. So, um, and by the way, you and I can only be, uh, be good or truthful or have righteous through the Holy Spirit. Because these are gifts of the Spirit. Amen. And unless, unless the Holy Spirit abides within you, and my body and your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, unless it is clean and the Holy Spirit abides in you, it's very unlikely that your fruit and my fruit will be goodness Righteousness and truth. It's just that way. It must have been interesting is when Paul, who previously was the one who was hunting down Christians and actually signed the decree to have St. Stephen stoned and martyred. Yep. And all of a sudden he's on the way to Emmaus. Exactly. Because you know, they said, why did we follow this guy Paul? He just was, was, was killed Christians. Yeah. So it must have been interesting. Time. That's exactly right. This is what conversion does, isn't it? Correct. So, thus in Ephesians 5.11, and we are unpacking Ephesians 5.11, the Apostle Paul tells the believers to expose the unfruitful works of darkness by exhibiting, by exhibiting the righteous alternative for all to see. You see, the problem with us is that we love to expose the fruit of darkness by going to the brother and saying, Man, you made a mistake, and you're going to pay for that. <laughs> Is that what the Lord says you should be doing? No. No. When I turn around and says, Victor, you made a mistake, be careful. Be careful. That's how it is. 
Yeah. So in Ephesians, yes. Well, I wanted to say the greatest story in the Bible about this is David when he came to uh, fight Goliath. His brother said, "What are you doing here? You're you're causing mischief." Imagine if David listened to that and not fight Goliath. So, okay. like you said, how we get we expose the works, but what do we do to that person is really important. We can destroy that person, exactly. and or we can make that person part of heaven. Exactly. Not, and that is the that is the issue. Exactly, David. And this is why uh, last week's lesson is so important. Words matter. Speech matters. Yeah. And when it comes from the heart and it's pure through the Holy Spirit, it's very important. Very quickly. I put my, I put my situation. Uh, you know, when something is wrong with me, God, He never came to accuse me. He came to make me understand my situation, to help me. Like when people were sick in those times when Jesus Christ was here, he was helping them. He wasn't saying, you are like this because you're paying the consequence for this and that, no. He was expressing his love. Correct. Same as now with in, in our family. Sometimes our kids, they are in drug, alcohol, or prostitution. I don't want to wait to be perfect to say something to my kid because I never going to be perfect until the transformation. But I have to be in front of God the most, the most uh, I can be in God to talk to my kid with love, no accusing, but trying to let them to understand, even praying for them, but never wait to be perfect for for now to talk to the kid. That's not that's not gonna happen. So exactly right. I was just gonna say a, t a text in the Bible on that one. Proverbs 18, verse 21. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Right. Amen. Let me ask your advice. <clears throat> when you're dealing with fellowshipping with unfruitful, immediate family members and best friends, even Jesus said he lived in Capernaum most of his life, a prophet has no honor in his hometown. Right. So what do you, what's your advice with dealing with immediate family that says, look at you, you were before you, or sinners just like us. Our best friends would say, that. why should we follow you? Why should we believe in your Christ? That's a, such a, a great question. And yeah, yeah, you know, some of us, uh, some of us have faced that significantly. My 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 parents are missionaries. My father's a pastor, or was a pastor. He's he's dead now. And if I reflected something negative, one of the first things that I was thrown to, Victor, you should know better. Your parents, your your your, your father taught you. Your mother taught you. What's wrong with you? The reality is. We're all sinners. The reality is we're all in a journey. The reality is that the, the propensity to sin is there every day. And I'm going to tell you whether you like it or not, you and I probably will be sinning every day. However, God has promised that when we walk with by faith, when we, by faith, accept what he did for us on the cross, that his righteousness can be imparted and imputed in us through life. And upon his coming, if that's been positive because of the forgiveness of our sins, you and I will inherit eternal life. Amen. That's just the bottom line. Works of darkness also means the doctrine. Exactly. Because it's not people here. It's talking about the works right. of darkness. Right. So, okay. Let, let's go on. I mean, I'm sorry, guys. My wife tells me every time I teach, you're an abuser of time. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I, I'm, I, she laughed, so I could say that. So, so, so I, have to, I have to tell you, I have to tell you that. Let's go on pretty quickly for, for the remainder because I want to unpack verses 14, 13 and 14 here very quickly. Verses 13, 513. Can I have 513? Verses 513, Paul here makes it clear that believers, by exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit, may bring non-believers to have faith and a relationship with Christ. So what does that say? But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light for Whatever makes manifest is light, says verses 13. You see, the Holy Spirit and the Word of God are light 
and reveal hidden things. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Not your righteousness. Not your walk. Okay. Therefore, when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. And so, Paul tells us in, in uh, as Paul tells us in Ephesians 5.13, it is the light that makes everything visible. Please note, let's read Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, of chapter 4, uh, actually it's 14.12. And if I didn't do that, that was a mistake, so I'm going to read it. If he's, uh, Hebrews 14.12 says, The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Doctrine. Doctrine yes. Scripture. Holy Spirit. That's the vehicle you embrace. Not, not the pastor. And I'm, I'm not degrading any pastor. Not the elder. Elder Victor. Not the teacher, 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 whatever. It's that. That's essential. When, um, and so th that is important. So the Apostle Paul does not envision harsh public confrontation with their uh, pagan neighbors. Instead, as Paul is talking to the Ephesians, he imagines that the believers will employ a strategy of showing forth God's goodness as they engage with the, the unbelievers. By exhibiting righteous, God-honoring lifestyle for all to see, and that is for you and for me, this type of witness holds the, problem, uh, the, the promise of darkness to light transformation um, because of the light. When I have somebody says to me, I, I don't know why that person hasn't, hasn't accepted God yet. And I live with that person. I don't quite understand what, what is going on. Have you ever asked the question, is my walk such that encourages that person to ask the question, why are you the way you are? And if you don't have that experience, then you're probably not peculiar. So, let's now go into uh, verse 14, Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 5.14. Here's, uh, here's the instruction. Therefore, he says, awake, you asleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Who is he talking to? Us. Us. <coughs> That's the bottom line. You and I. That's exactly right. And he, he took that from Isaiah chapter 60, verses one, two, three. I'm not going to read that. I don't, have the, I don't have the time. But Ephesians 5.14 is a powerful appeal to Christian believers to awake uh, to their role as missionaries and refractors of the light of Christ in the darkness. I'm not going to read it. Put it in your mind. Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. Matthew chapter 5, verses 16. Here's Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before man that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So, when Paul tells us, walk in love, walk in light, and walk in wisdom. How do you walk? In Jesus. Mary. Well, Wednesday's section is entitled Snapping Up the Bargains. And Paul concludes this section of Ephesians that we're studying this week, Ephesians 1 to 20. He's going to conclude it here with a few exhortations, completing a section with this sustained interest in sexual purity. And I'll add to that that he's also reiterating um, this lifestyle theme and how we walk. So if we bring up Ephesians 5, 15 to 17, it says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So what are some of the key points that Paul is urging and encouraging us here? Well, first of all, in verse 15, 
he says, look carefully how you walk. Again, this is the same Greek word that means how you conduct yourself and how you regulate your life. Be careful how you live, how you manage yourself. Be in control of yourself. Then he continues in that same verse saying, don't be unwise, but wise. Now this Greek word for wise means to be wise in a practical sense. One who in action is governed by piety, that's holiness, and integrity or righteousness. So that's how we should be living. Now if you note in verse 17, there's a parallel admonition to what verse 15 is. He says, therefore, do not be foolish, right? Foolish is like unwise. And in verse 17, what is the solution to not being foolish? What's the last part of verse 17 say? Understanding of God's will. That's right, to understand the will of God. And he had sort of mentioned this in verse 10 of the same chapter when he said, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Right Now he's saying, understand what the will of the Lord is. And the Greek word for will means to know of what God wishes to be done by us. Okay, So that's what he's saying. We need to understand what God is wanting us to know, what he wants us to do. Remember that earlier um, in verse, in chapter 1 of Ephesians, Paul proclaimed that God has made known to us the mystery of his will. So God's word is full of counsel regarding his will for us. We have to search for this counsel right. and apply it to our daily living. Also, he's mentioning wisdom here, and the scriptures are replete with wisdom. Um, he's saying, don't look within for wisdom, but to be truly wise is to reach beyond ourselves to who? To God, right? Remember what God had inspired King Solomon to, wrote, to write in Proverbs 9.10, and we know that the book of Proverbs is known as the book of wisdom, yep. right? right? Book of wisdom. Mm -hmm. So in Proverbs 9.10, he wrote, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. wisdom yeah. And I'm going to read a few more verses, just three verses here that I found in Proverbs 9 related to wisdom. In Proverbs 4.5, he says, get wisdom and understanding. Mm -hmm. And in Proverbs 4, 7, he says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. I'm sorry, we don't have the verses up there. Sorry, I, 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 threw these in, I threw these in at the last minute, so I apologize. Okay. So I'm reading these. They're not up on the screen. But these are all what God inspired King Solomon to leave for us regarding wisdom. So in verse 7, he says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all you're getting, get understanding. And lastly, in Proverbs 4.11, he says, this is God speaking, I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in right paths. So here again is that reference to how we walk, our lifestyle. And are we choosing the right path? Are we choosing the right lifestyle? Are we making wise, correct choices and how we conduct ourselves. Now, if you can go back to the three um, verses listed, 15, 16, yes. So in between verse 15 and 17, there's another directive. He's saying making the best use of the time right. because yeah. the days are evil. Mm -hmm. And in King James, Instead of making the best use of time, it says redeeming the time. Right. So here, Paul is encouraging intentional discipleship with the vivid image. Okay, the lesson points that the Greek word for redeeming is 
an intensive form of the verb to buy. Okay, so that's where the title, snapping up the, mar the bargains. Take this time to buy what the Lord has to offer. However, this word I looked up in the Greek lexicon, it can also mean to make a wise and sacred use right. for every opportunity for doing good. And I really like that definition of it. Right. We're encouraged to make wise and sacred use of our time for every opportunity to do good. Yes, David? Well, thank you for that because it's like the time creates an urgency. Yes. If there, so time, introducing you know, knowledge of good and evil means not life and death. It's the same the way, you know, it's like the same thing. So because we don't have enough time, every, of every moment there's an opportunity. <coughs> and that creates an urgency. So death in itself is actually a, a blessing so that we can be closer to God and not just keep going forever with the same bad lifestyle. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Well, I'm not against it, but social media and yeah. television is the best time killers in the world. Amen. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think you have a lot of support in that statement. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And this is a great transition into that Greek word for time describes a moment of opportunity that we now have between now and Christ's second coming, or if he calls us to rest, right? We have to make the most of that time. Today, it's an opportunity for us to seek him and to make wise use of it, right. to do good, to live as we've, as we've been reading and studying in chapter five. So in summary, we're to take advantage of the time we have from now until Christ comes to live our life with true wisdom, which we have sought from God, and to continually, constantly seek to comprehend what his will is for us. That's something that we should always be striving for to understand better. And this is really the only way that we can live without being foolish, but being wise. And I'd like to end with two quotes from Sister White, and I, I hope we have those. Would someone like to read um, this first quote? Yes, David. We are to seek to understand more and still more perfectly what is comprehended in the living incarnation of the excellence of Christ Jesus. We must learn of him how to work, how to walk circumspectly, how to do the work he has given us by being laborers together with God, wise and understanding what the will of the Lord is. We need to depend more entirely on Christ. If we believe in Christ Jesus and will ask him in faith for his restoring power intact, in skill, in wisdom, doing all in accordance with his word, then we shall not be disappointed. Amen. Oh, how much of the Holy Spirit we might have day by day if we would walk circumspectly, denying self and practicing the virtues of Christ's character. And now Israel, what do, doeth the Lord thy God require of thee, but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways and to love him and serve the Lord by thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statues which I commanded thee this day for thy good. Amen. These are encouraging inspired words for us to remember to make the use of our time to walk carefully circumspectly and that the Lord will give us of his Holy Spirit if we stay focused on Christ. Thanks, Mary. Spirit-filled worship. Spirit-filled worship. So that's Thursday's lesson titled Spirit-Filled Worship. And today's lesson really centers on Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. And as we know, spirit-filled worship should be inspiring to each one of us. Amen. But we also need to be mindful of what spirit 
faith-filled worship means, what it is, and what it's not. So let's begin by reading Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. If someone could please read that for us. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. It's, it's such a beautiful verse. So what is Paul telling us here? Do not be drunk with wine. In the Greek, the word is oinos. And in this verse in particular, it doesn't have a dual meaning. It's not talking about doctrine. It's talking about literal wine, actual literal wine. And in past lessons, we've talked about and we've covered why fermented wine isn't good for us physically or spiritually. And uh, Proverbs 20, verse 21 tells us, of course, that wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's not wise is my earlier life, I indulged in that. I had a very um, substantial wine collection, very proud of it back then. And when I read this as well as other verses, I thought, wow, what a fool I have been. And I've been around a lot of people who have been drunken with wine. And what it leads to is obviously drunkenness. Worst thing to see are people who are drunk when you're sober. I mean, it's, it's very eye-opening. It's really, it's a sad situation. Because what happens is the person changes. Their mind changes. And they become crude, could become sexually explicit in their speech. But you also see mindlessness. Right. That's one thing that really got me. What if something happened to Mary? Or what if something happened to one of my family or friends and they needed help, an emergency happened, and I was drunk or intoxicated? Yep. Their life or someone else's life could be in your hands, right. a situation that you can't control. But this mindlessness that goes on, you can't think, you can't rationalize. Immorality, idolatry, etc. But what Paul is saying is, put that aside. You think that's good? No. Put that aside and exchange it and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And just ask yourself, would spirit-filled worship lead us to mindlessness? Would it lead us to worldliness in our worship to God? Or would he guide us according to the fruits of the Spirit that we've talked about this morning? So speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, that's spirit-filled worship. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, making melody in our heart to the Lord, giving thanks, not occasionally, but always for all the things that God the Father has done in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So think about this. Spirit-filled worship involves the entire Godhead. Amen. Mm -hmm. We're filled by the Holy Spirit. We're giving thanks to God the Father through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That involves the entire Godhead. And I saw a hand go, Walter. Yeah, well, you're talking, it reminds me about L.A.G.Y. In one of her books, talking about uh, people who was preaching. They were preaching drunk. They, for them, it was normal to be drunk and to be preaching, even smelling cigarettes. That's how she started to be writing about all of these things under the Holy Spirit inspiration, how bad it was. It was. Can you imagine a person drunk giving a message of God? How do you think you're going to help the people? Right. Exactly. What's the witness going to be? It, it certainly isn't going to be accurate, that's for sure. And that's if they could even get the words out. Let's read uh, three verses, Colossians 3.16, then we'll read Acts 16.25, and then James 5.13. So if someone could please read Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Thank you. 
So think of that verse. They're teaching and admonishing one another. It's, it's teaching. Admonishing isn't a cruel act. Admonishing is, should be lovingly correcting, bringing into alignment, bringing into alignment with God and singing with grace in our hearts. So it has dual purposes, but all the purposes are directed to our worship of God. So Psalms, you think of going back and reading Psalms. How much do you learn in the book of Psalms? So much, so much. So they're not only singing praises, but he's admonishing his, his self, his own behavior. So you think about that. That's what, that's what singing psalms and hymns of praise are. They should be biblically based and having us give thanks to God for his love in wanting to correct us. By that's the thing. The admonishing isn't what I think. It's using God's word to do it, Amen. which should be the only source of admonishing. Right. <laughs> and it's not admonishing to put us down. It's to lift right. us up. That's the purpose of the admonishment. It's, you know, um, in Revelation, the Lord admonishes those who he, or he rebukes those who he loves. So he does it out of the motivation of love, not for tearing down. Acts 16, 25, if someone could please read that. Then at midnight, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Amen. Thank you. So you can imagine Paul and Silas as they were in jail, they were praying and singing hymns to God. I just wonder exactly what were those words. I'm sure they weren't mindless because they knew where they were at. I'm sure they weren't in a rock and roll type of mindset with high emotion because it says that the prisoners were listening to them. They were listening. David. That, 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 that is what is so important. Doxology. It's, it's spirit-filled worship for me is with my words and my actions, how many spirits I guide to Jesus. Because we are actually spiritual beings living a flesh life. So with our flesh, which is our tongue, that is the most influencer of the spirit, what am I doing with my tongue? How many spirits am I bringing to God is really the question, like, am I available for as many spirits as possible for Jesus? Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. Let's read James 5.13. I love this. It's so simple. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. <laughs> so psalms and singing and giving praise to the Lord should be cheerful. I think that's, I just think that's so simple and so beautiful. The lesson points out that in spirit-filled worship, there are two elements at work here. First and foremost is there's a vertical relationship between us and God. The specific object of our attention should be who or what? God, Jesus, yes, exactly. And then second is a horizontal relationship. And that's when singing praises to the Lord as a church body in a sense, what we're doing is we're giving praise to God in unison. We're of the same mindset. We're praising God together with each other as a church body to the Lord. That's so powerful. So then we now know what spirit-filled worship should be like. On a practical sense, we have to think of, well, what isn't spiritual worship? Because we know the enemy is out attacking. He's going to attack us, and he is attacking us from within the church. So we have to be mindful of this, and it's something that we have to address. So just as the Apostle Paul cautions us against drinking wine because it intoxicates our thoughts, our words, and our actions, worship or music, too, can greatly impact our worship experience with the Lord by influencing our thoughts, words, and actions, too. Music can be a wonderful, wonderful gift that God has given us if it's used to His honor and glory. But it could also be destructive when it's not. And I'll read something from uh, Ellen White in just a moment. But we have, 
we all have differing preferences as far as worship style, worship music. And it's not to say this is right or this is wrong. That's not for me to judge. But we have to ask the Holy Spirit, is this, is this right in your eyes? Is this honoring you? Or is it honoring the performers, the performance, or taking us out of a mindset of you and putting us in a different mindset? So, spirit-filled worship should not lead us into mindlessness with repetition of words in vain repetition. And Jesus cautions us in Matthew 6, verse 7. I think we all know that. Jesus himself is telling us, don't pray in vain repetition, right? Well, wouldn't this also apply in our singing of hymns and songs of praise? Because what are, what are our songs of praise? We're singing prayers. So if we're singing in vain repetition, that's not to say that words can't be repeated. Of course they are. That's why we have courses and, and things like that. That's, that's very purposeful. But it, I don't know if you guys have ever been to other Protestant churches. Mary and I have, because different family members, and we've gone, where they'll sing five to ten minutes repeating the same thing. And I'm not kidding. And it's almost like it leads people into an altered state of mind, mindlessness. Correct. I'm not judging them because they may be going according to the dictates of their hearts and their understanding. Okay. But nonetheless, we have to pay attention to this. So then how can we individually, individually and as a church body, how can we discern what is spirit-filled worship or, what, or not? The Lord always tells us, and again, we covered it in... Um, in Isaiah 8 20 if they speak not according to the law and to the testimony there's no light in them so listen to the lyrics that are being sung are they biblically based are they doctrinally sound if we're going to start singing hymns where they substitute Sabbath for Sunday if they start substituting uh, death as we are now in heaven we ha we just have to be mindful of that it's not to tear the person down it's to be mindful of this so that we can make adjustments and corrections because the enemy is very crafty in how he influences the church and how he tries to break up and divide the church more importantly. And very briefly, when Mary and I were in Petaluma, the Petaluma church was once a thriving church. As I believe it may have been the oldest church, in, uh, Adventist church in California is 80 or 90 years old. They had a huge division in the church. The youth wanted drums, band, contemporary Christian music, and the older ones didn't. So they saw it as a divide between young and old. That's how Satan goes in and destroys our churches. Starts in subtly, and then it becomes an issue, and then it becomes a divisive issue leading to division. So also, do the words in music give honor and praise to the Lord or to the performance of the performers? We have to think of that too in our worship service. Does our spirit-filled worship fill us with fruits of the Spirit in humble reverence and awe to God, or does it fill us again with mindless meditation through vain repetition? Or it can also go to the other extreme. I've been to a, a, another church uh, with a family member that the worship music is super highly energized. I would call it secularized Christian music, where it's rock and roll where you have smoke on the screen and the lights going like this and the drummer clapping his sticks and twirling them. It's a show. Well, is that to God's honor and glory or is it to the performers? So again, it's something just to be mindful of. And spiritual filled worship, it should be cheerful and reverent because it brings us closer to God. But we should be prayerfully careful in what we bring into the church. And I'm not speaking against contemporary Christian music because there's some contemporary Christian music that's beautiful, it's wonderful, it's powerful in giving us insight to God, but some is not. So again, that's why we have to be mindful because um, introducing music that is not spirit-filled, it may bring in false teachings, again, mindlessness, worldly emotions to the church body, 
And we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, what's one of the big things that we are commissioned to preach in the everlasting gospel? Yes, thank you. Spot on, the three angels' message. What's the second angel's message? Hmm. Give glory to God, is that the second one? I wish you would Come out of the Babylon. Thank you. Yeah. Come mm -hmm. out of Babylon. So God's people who he loves, as we know, are in all types of churches. So he's calling them out of Babylon. So why would we then want to emulate worship service of any sort or music from what is considered to be Babylon? We're called to be a peculiar people. We need to use wisdom and discernment from the Holy Spirit. So Ellen White quotes, and I'm going to close with this. Music was made to serve a holy purpose, to lift the thoughts to that which is pure, noble, and elevating, and to awaken in the soul devotion and gratitude to God. What a contrast between ancient custom and the uses to which music is now too often devoted. How many employ this gift to exalt self instead of using it to glorify God? A love for music leads the unwary to unite with the world lovers in pleasure gatherings where God has forbidden his children to go. Thus, that which is a great blessing when rightly used becomes one of the most successful agencies by which Satan allures the mind. I so much want our youth, our young adults, to understand this. We were all young. Maybe we all have pasts. I probably went to more rock and roll concerts probably than this entire room times a factor of five or six. My <laughs> uncle was in the music business, so I got concert tickets all the time. And I went like crazy. And if I knew this back then, if I had somebody share this with me back then, it would have resulted in different choices, different experiences, etc. But let me continue here. Um, it, it's the most, it becomes the most successful agencies by which Satan allures the mind from duty and from the contemplation of eternal things. Music forms, this is so important, music forms a part of God's worship in the courts above. And we should endeavor in our songs of praise to approach as nearly as possible to the harmony of the heavenly choirs. The proper training of the voice is an important feature in education and should not be neglected. Lastly, singing as a part of religious, ex religious service is as much an act of worship as is prayer. So powerful. So music, our worship service, is so powerful if it's spirit-filled. And we just have to be cautious and guard that because that is a medium by which we are drawing closer to God. And we just have to be discerning with that. That's Thanks so much, Greg. And I, I appreciate the time that you spent to talk about worship because that matters. It's just the way it is. Uh, in the, in the, I, I've just um, given those of you here in the classroom a document that will appear right there. And uh, what I wanted to do with this document is to really summarize verses uh, 1 to 20 of chap chapter 5 in a way that you could really think. And by the way, this isn't Victor. Um, the, the writer of, of uh, the lesson um, really is the proposal of this, pa uh, this uh, pathway that we are going to go to. So looking back at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 20 as a whole, we see the Apostle Paul um, taking a strong position against sin and evil. And you and I should follow that, especially in the form of sexual immorality and crude speech. Speech we spoke about last week, and it is important. So Paul is unwilling to accept the presence of corrupt behavior among the people of God. Instead, Paul calls the believers, you and I, in, in, and, and those in Ephesians, or in Ephesus, to a high standard of conduct so as to embrace their identity as the beloved children of God and the saints. 
or only ones, as we read in, in the first ten verses of chapter 5. Therefore, Paul, believe, uh, Paul believes that when the Christians in community, when are we in community? When we are together. When we are together in faith. We are together in body, physically, and so We're in community. So, um, where, are we, where are we? Okay, in community, embrace a high standard of conduct as beloved children of God. They shine a light into the darkness, drawing their neighbors away from self-defeating lifestyles and into God's grace and truth, as he wrote in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 11 to 14. This document summarizes that, those 20 verses that way. I hope you see it. So Paul imagines God's church buoyed by a renewed commitment to walk as children of light while they wait Christ's return, as Paul describes in verses 8, 15, and 16 of chapter 5. But Paul also imagines God's church blessed by the presence of Christ as they gather to worship. And you just heard Greg provide a good summary on that. But Paul also imagines God's church motivated by their status as beloved children of God and by Christ's death for them, as he states in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Paul imagines God's church filled with God's spirit, as stated in chapter 5, verses 18. That's a great summary of what Paul was saying and writing. Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20, that when God's people come together to worship the Lord, the worship is characterized by energy and joy. And why is that? Because the Holy Spirit is within. Energy and joy. We rejoice God. As together they sing thanksgiving praise to our Lord Jesus Christ and to God the Father with a firm grip on Evelyn realities. God's people celebrate their hope for the future. And how is that done? Rooted in the story of what God has done for you and for me. Rooted on what God is doing today and will do tomorrow for you and for me. And what God will accomplish through Jesus Christ our Lord. When we interpret Ephesians 5, the way we've just expressed, this passage of script, scripture becomes more than a set of disconnected commands about Christian living. This passage of scripture becomes a prophetic call concerning Christian identity, Christian commitment, Christian community, and worship in the last days. Does God want to establish a community, his own church? You better believe it. It becomes a pathos-filled invitation to take advantage of the freedom and the opportunities we currently have to be God's faithful people and ambassadors of his kingdom, as we read in verses 16. What is this passage all about? Being an ambassador. How do you become an ambassador? Walk in love. Walk in light. Walk in wisdom. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you're a marvelous God. And I want to thank you, Lord, for your amazing love, your agape love. Father, we want to be yours. We want to walk in love. We want to love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength. And Father, we want to love our neighbors, our brothers, our friends, our enemies, as we love ourselves. And then, Father, we want to be able to walk and, and be shining the light that you provide to us. And through, Father, I want to ask that you help us provide to you and trust to you our will so that is molded into your will. 
I ask, O oh Lord, that you help us die for self. So that as we move forward, as your servants, we may shine the light. We may reveal your character, your truth, and your love. And then, Father, through the word of God and the Holy Spirit, I want to ask, O oh Lord, that you help us walk in wisdom. Heavenly Father, thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for, for the word of God. Thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be your children. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful day.